Okay, so what I'd like to talk to you about is the resolution of a conjecture. So naturally, the first thing I need to do is sort of say why, you know, why should you even listen about this conjecture? And then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how you might prove this statement. So to understand this conjecture called the NLTS conjecture, which stands for the no low energy trivial states conjecture, it's important to start by looking back at classical proofs. So in classical proofs or the mathematics of it, you know, we think of this class NP, which is all efficient polynomial time uh, checkable proofs. And the nice thing about NP is that it's a very nice structure. It's so structured that there's a complete problem uh, called constraint satisfaction, which basically says that, you know, you can always write your proof down in a very nice logical manner, such that it looks like a sequence of bits, and that there are these very local checks. And each local check um, is some function CI, you know, it could be something as simple as just taking the parity of the three bits involved, or it could be something more general. Uh, but it says that, you know, if you look at all these local checks CI and you sort of combine them together, you say, are all of them satisfied or what fraction of them are satisfied, then you get that it's NP complete to decide if there exists an X which satisfies each of the CIs, so CI evaluates to zero for every one of them, or if for all Xs that you could write down, at least one of these checks is unsatisfied, right? So this is NP completeness. It just is very nice structure uh, with local checks. Now there's two natural extensions of NP that one should think about. The first we'll talk about is QMA. You know, the, the reason we're here, talk about the quantum version. And uh, so what do we first want to say? Well, we're going to start looking at quantum proofs. So if you have a quantum proof, it's going to necessitate a quantum verifier. You know, someone, if they're going to read these quantum bits, they might as well they need to be a quantum computer, otherwise it's basically classical. And the beautiful thing proven by Kitaev was that calculating the ground energy of local Hamiltonians serves as a complete problem for the class QMA. And in that sense, there's a very natural uh, uh, analog of constraint satisfiability where there's a local Hamiltonian, which is just a small linear operator, which calculates the energy or the frustration that occurs on a few of the particles at a time. And if you combine a lot of these local uh, energy checks, you get a global energy function, and that's going to be the analog. So to fully write out the analog, the ground energy is the minimum eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. And just like it was NP complete to decide if uh, the, the satisfiability was low or high, we get that it's QMA complete to decide for some uh, b minus a, whether the minimum eigenvalue or the satisfiability of this Hamiltonian is either below a or above b. Right? So what this tells us is something really nice. So in, when we looked at NP, we said, hey, you know, all your proofs, they morally should just look at con like constraint satisfaction problems. And therefore, solutions to CSPs are sort of a canonical notion of proofs. Well, what this says is that the same kind of holds for the quantum setting, that canonically, the ground states of a local Hamiltonian is, is general enough for all notions of quantum proofs. And now comes something sort of peculiar once you realize this fact that uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians are canonical, is that when we start to introduce the widely believed assumption that NP doesn't equal QMA, or that quantum proofs are more powerful than classical proofs, we get the important consequence that not all ground states of local Hamiltonians can be classically described in a verifiable manner. Or equivalently, you can't convert a ground state of a Hamiltonian into some sort of classical version of the verification. And now this is sort of amazing because seemingly out of nowhere, we've arrived at a statement about the complexity of physical systems purely from computational means, right? We're saying something about even how hard it is to describe quantum systems, and this is just coming from computation. Okay, so let's keep this boxed idea in mind, and let's go on to the other extension of uh, proofs that has happened since NP. So just to like a little historical context, NP and the notions of non-determinism stuff, this sort of traces back to the early 70s. QMA was proved to be, uh, you know, the ground states were this canonical proof in 99, and PCPs were around the same time in the late 90s uh, came about. 
So what are PCPs? PCPs stand for probabilistically checkable proofs, and they come about from this idea that we think of proofs naturally as sort of step-by-step -step checking. You know, you write down a proof in any of the papers that have been presented today, there's like a line five has to fall from line four, which has to fall from line three, et cetera, all the way down. And if all of them follow from the previous, you know, you have a correct proof. But the PCP theorem sort of breaks that intuition and it says, in fact, you can take every NP problem, you know, every proof, and you can rewrite it, you can convert it via reductions into a different form such that you only need to read a few of the bits, a constant number of bits, in order to be 99% confident in the proof's correctness. So one way to look at that is, it's like saying, hey, it's NP hard to decide if either there is a solution or if all solutions must violate most of the checks. So remember, M was sort of the number of checks, so M over 2 says you must violate 50% of the checks. And previously, just from the NP completeness, this was just one. So we've gone from it's NP complete to decide if one term is unsatisfied or all of them are satisfied to now determining if almost all of them, 50%, are unsatisfied. So maybe it's worth saying how this second formulation follows from the boxed or you know, how are they equivalent. Well, let's just realize that if you are in one of two worlds, right? you're either in world one or you're in world two, where either there exists an x such that every term is satisfied, or you live in a world where for all x, 50% uh, of the checks are unsatisfied. So consider the following thought process where you pick a random check and you check if it was satisfied or unsatisfied. If you live in world one, you'll always find out that it's satisfied. And if you live in world two, 50% of the time, you'll find out that it was unsatisfied. So world one is like a coin that always comes up heads, and world two is like a coin that comes up heads at most 50% of the time. So you know how many times would you have to flip that coin before you were certain that you were in world one versus world two? Well, to get some 99% confidence, it would only take a constant number of flips. So this idea that you can look at a proof in terms of satisfiability really was seminal to you know, how we think about proofs now. There's another important consequence of this, which is not often, I think, brought up enough in the classical setting, but is uh, very important, which is that once you have a PCP theorem, a notion of a noisy proof suffices. So, in fact, what I can say is that any x such that cx is, let's say, less than m over 4, or it satisfies 75% of the checks, that's a, that's a proof in the sense that it can also be verified with a constant number of queries. Because what happens now is if you have an x that satisfies 75% of the checks, that's like a coin that comes up heads with 75% of the time, and you just want to make sure you don't have a coin that comes up heads with less than 50, right? So again, you get this fact that only a constant number of flips is required in order to recognize which of the two situations you're in. So now what we have with the PCP theorem is that the set of proofs is much more expansive. Originally, the set of proofs that we thought of as reasonable were the x's that satisfied the entire constraint system. But now you could even say, hey, in fact, any x that satisfies 75% of the constraints has cx less than m over 4, that's also a valid proof. So the set of sort of valid proofs has been amplified uh, due to the PCP theorem. So if we were to put these two ideas together, if we were to sort of combine the notions of QMA and PCP, we would get a conjectured set of mathematical objects called quantum PCPs. And what that conjecture says is that every QMA problem or every quantum proof, you can always convert it into a form so that only a constant number of the bits need to be, excuse me, a constant number of the qubits need to be measured because the QMA proof has to be a quantum state. Or equivalently, you might say it's actually equivalent to sort of saying, hey, is it easy to decide whether there exists a state that satisfies all the Hamiltonians, you know, has zero energy, it's a ground state? Or is it the case that uh, it's very frustrated, this Hamiltonian, that for every state psi, psi h psi is bigger than some epsilon m. And in the classical setting that epsilon was one half, we don't know exactly what it is, so right now I'll write it down as epsilon. Um, but there's something important that comes up, which is just similar to the PCP theorem. What we get is that 
if a quantum PCP conjecture was true, then the set of proofs is now much more massive, right? Initially, the set of proofs was morally just the ground states, but now we're getting that the set of proofs actually is all these states, all the states of energy less than epsilon over 2m. And for any constant epsilon and any local Hamiltonian, that's an exponential uh, set of um, exponentially sized space. So it's a much, much larger set of proofs now, if the quantum PCP conjecture is true. And that is going to impose some interesting challenges. So let's look at the two ideas that we sort of brought up before. One was that assuming NP doesn't equal QMA, the quantum proofs cannot be classically described. Right? And the second one was that because of the PCP conjecture, the, excuse me, the quantum PCP conjecture, low energy states are also a valid form of proof. So if you combined ideas A and B, you're going to get something that's actually seemingly surprising, which says that you must be able to write down local Hamiltonian systems for which classical descriptions don't exist for any low energy state. Because the low energy states are proofs, and proofs shouldn't be classically described. Right? And this, this seems like a tall order to ask. <coughs> so what we're seeing is that quantum proofs seem to say something not just about computation, uh, non-deterministic quantum computation, but they're also saying something about the complexity of quantum states themselves and the sort of Hamiltonians you could find. Okay. But now here's the hard part is what does it mean to have no succinct classical description? It's sort of a vague kind of idea. You know, it's very hard to say that there's no way to write it down classically. So maybe this black boxed statement is a little too hard to tackle right now. So what we can say is let's just take uh, an ansatz as to what succinct classical descriptions mean, and then let's see if that result is true. So what we could say is, you know, one huge family of uh, classical descriptions for quantum states is short circuits. So probably uh, we've seen through a variety of the talks in this conference that if you have a constant depth quantum circuit, that uh, is a classically verifiable description of a quantum state. So if we combine these two ideas, we end up with this conjecture, the, the main conjecture of today's talk, which is the no low energy trivial states conjecture, first put out by Friedman and Hastings in 2014, that said, hey, there, uh, there must exist local Hamiltonians so that none of the low energy states can be written as the output of a uh, constant depth quantum circuit. And this conjecture, you know, if you were a skeptic of anything I've said up to now, if you were a skeptic of, you know, whether quantum PCP is true, then this double boxed conjecture uh, seems like a great target to hit, right? If you could prove that this conjecture is false, because it's a consequence of the quantum PCP, you would have proved that the quantum PCP is false in one go, and we wouldn't have had to do anything more complicated. And in fact, there was a lot of evidence to point that NLTS might have been false. Uh, there was a landmark result by uh, Brandau and Harrow, which provided very good product state approximations for a large family of local Hamiltonians. So it was suspected that maybe uh, product state approximation or you know, constant depth approximations of all local Hamiltonians existed. And maybe NLTS was false. So the goal of today is to sort of describe to you how we show that NLTS is true, its connections to error correction, and sort of what that might say a little bit about quantum PCPs afterwards. But before I do that, maybe I should say that you can also sort of ignore everything I've said up to now and look at NLTS as a statement about robust entanglement. Because constant depth quantum circuits are sort of the classically describable states. So what we're saying is that the low energy subspace of some Hamiltonians have no classical description. Or that at constant temperatures, some constant of the total uh, energy, that the state seems to always be entangled, no matter which low energy state you're in. And that's a sort of a statement of a physically realizable robust entanglement. So you might be totally uninterested about the quantum PCP idea, and that's perfectly fine. But I hope to convince you that this is a statement about some sort of physically uh, constructible entanglement. So the main result of our work, uh, joined between myself, Anurag Anshu, and Nico Bruckman, was to show that 
local Hamiltonians that correspond to uh, most, uh, and I'll explain why I've asterisked that later, uh, linear rate and linear distance quantum LDPC error correcting codes, sort of that these uh, error correcting codes uh, satisfy the NLTS uh, condition. And I should say that, you know, this is sort of a um, kind of a builds on a, a long standing line of recent works in actual constructions of linear rate and linear distance codes, right? Only, it was only, I think, at last QIP that we saw these constructions um, uh, play out. And what, what I'll say is that our theorem says something about the complexity of you know, a generic construction of linear rate and linear distance codes with some extra property that I'll explain in due course. And we can show that that set of uh, codes isn't vacuous. Um, the leverrier zemore construction uh, actually satisfies that. But in today's talk, I won't be actually saying anything about that construction. I'll just be saying, you know, what are the properties you need in order to satisfy NLTS? So formally, what we say is that there exists some epsilon and a uh, Hamiltonian family H, so that any uh, state psi of energy less than epsilon n, and so psi can not only, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a pure state, it can be even a mixture. Uh, for any such state psi, the minimum circuit depth required to generate psi is log n. So we can show that not only uh, is it super constant, but it actually grows logarithmically. Okay, so, before I get into that, maybe I should see if there's just any questions about sort of the high level why we care about this problem or anything. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, so my sketch of the proof is going to be sort of tripartite. The first is I hope to sort of explain uh, the way I like to think about trivial states, which are just uh, output states that are the outputs of small circuits. And I like to think of them as local Hamiltonians, and I, I'll say why that implies circuit depth lower bounds. Second is I'll say why does error correction come into play, and thirdly I'll talk a little bit about you know, why uh, quantum error correction comes into play and how to think about it via erasure errors. So let's start with the first idea, and let's just realize that what we're really trying to do is prove circuit depth lower bounds, right? We're trying to prove that all the low energy states cannot be generated by low depth circuits. So that's just proving some circuit bound on states. And in order to do that, we're gonna need some sort of techniques. But before we do that, let's first just verify the statement that low depth states are classical witnesses for energy. Right? I sort of claim to you that this was a reasonable ansatz for our classical descriptions. Let me at least make that statement rigorous. So, Here's uh, an idea. So let's say you have an, a local operator A, think of it acting on one of the qubits, and I sandwich it in between two unitaries U. And these unitaries U are going to be quantum circuits of uh, a fixed depth, depth T. What I get is that U dagger AU, or sort of the evolution of A underneath the unitary U, that operator isn't too big. Even though it a priori looks like this huge sandwich, in fact, there's a much simpler description, right? It only requires two to the t times whatever the size of A was initially uh, qubits to describe. The reason that is, is if you ever have any gate in the quantum circuit, like this orange gate to the left, notice that if it's far enough away from sort of this light cone from A, just sort of this emanation of information, that operator in orange is going to cancel with its conjugate, which sits on the other side. Right? So that operator I don't actually need to consider. So really what happens is that all the operators outside this light cone cancel with each other, and the size of this light cone is only 2 to the t times a. That's because if I assume that my circuit has, you know, uh, let's say two local gates, at any given layer, the size of uh, this light cone can only increase by a multiplicative factor. And let's note that in this setting, what I've said is I have not assumed anything about the connectivity of the circuit, right? That's how I get that this light cone grows exponentially. If this was a light cone on a geometrically local circuit, it would grow much slower, right? Okay. So now what I want to show is that if any state can be written as the output of a short circuit, then I can always compute the energy very quickly. And let's see how I do that. Well, I can write out psi h psi as the sum of 
local terms, right? It's just the sum of each of the local energies by linearity. And now I'll write out psi as u applied to some zero state, right? But then let's notice that what we have here now is a computation on roughly two to the t qubits, right? Just from the fact of this light cone picture on the right. That hi is a local operator, so if I sandwich it between u, it has a better representation uh, than just the big sandwich. And so if I have a computation on two to the t qubits, I can even do that on my classical computer in just one more exponential. So that's how I get that I can do this in classical two to the two to the t time. So really, actually, when I said that constant depth circuits uh, are witnesses, that was sort of a lie. What we actually have is that up, even up to log log n depth uh, classical circuits are witnesses, right? So roughly, I think I've hopefully sufficiently convinced you of this fact. OK, now let's get into something a little more fun. And let me tell you how I like to think of trivial states states that are the outputs of short circuits as local Hamiltonians. So to start off with, let's start off with the simplest state, uh, the all zero state, and that is the solution to a very simple Hamiltonian. And that's just the Hamiltonian which checks that every qubit is one. Uh, excuse me, checks that every qubit is not one. Right? It's a qubit-wise projector. Um, and this Hamiltonian H0, it's, you know, it's very simple. It has a lot of nice properties. One, it commutes, and its spectrum is just the integers. And the eigenvectors are just the basis states, and they each have eigenvalue of uh, the Hamming weight. Right? So it's a very simple uh, Hamiltonian, and the unique solution just follows because there's only one eigenvector of eigenvalue zero. OK, now let's take this Hamiltonian, and let's just rotate it by u, where u is a low-depth circuit. So let's call this guy hu. And what we're going to get immediately, just by the fact where the properties of H0 was that HU has some nice properties, right? It also has to commute. Its spectrum is going to be the same. And the eigenvalues just get rotated by U as well. And the best part is that HU is now a 2 to the T local Hamiltonian. And why is it a 2 to the T local Hamiltonian? It comes exactly from the same sandwiching argument from the previous slide. We get that uh, whenever you apply U and you sandwich uh, each of the Hamiltonian terms in between, most of it cancels. So what I get is that if I have a state that is defined by a low depth circuit, uh, there also exists a local Hamiltonian that I should always be thinking about, and that's the Hamiltonian HU. And this is actually going to be enough ammunition in order for us to prove our first uh, lower bound. So let's look at two states, psi and psi prime. And well, let's call them D locally indistinguishable. If for every region S of the qubit, so if I pick any S of the n qubits, as long as the size of S is bounded by D, if I have that the reduced uh, density matrices on those qubits look identical, then we're going to call these states locally indistinguishable. So let's get an example. So the cat states, which are the two cat states, one with a plus uh, global phase, one with a minus global phase, these states are n minus 1 locally indistinguishable. And that you can check just uh, pretty simply. You can just realize that any uh, reduced density matrix of n minus 1 or fewer qubits, it looks exactly like this. It loses the sign. It just turns into the classical mixture of zeros and ones. So now let's prove that if you satisfy some notion of local indistinguishability, you actually can prove some circuit depth lower bound about these states. So. Let's say I have two states, psi and psi prime, that are d-locally indistinguishable. And let's assume for contradiction that psi is the output of a circuit. It's the output of some circuit u of depth t. I'm going to argue that then 2 to the t must be at least d, which in turn says that t is at least log d and is a lower bound on the circuit depth of psi. Right? OK, so how are we going to do that? Well, let's take that Hamiltonian we built two slides ago, hu, and let's analyze it. So let's compute the energy of psi prime with hu. So this is just a thought experiment. There's no actual algorithm here. So if we compute the energy of psi prime with hu, the first line is just saying I can rewrite hu as the sum of local terms of the Hamiltonian. But then the second line says, actually, whatever the energy was with psi prime, that's the same as the energy with psi. 
And that's because HU is 2 to the t local, and we're going to assume that d is greater than 2 to the t, which gives us the local indistinguishability. So what it's saying is that HU cannot distinguish these two states psi and psi prime. That's what local indistinguishability gives us. But then this is just the energy of psi with HU, which is zero. Now we just have one other fact that we need, which is that remember that HU has a unique ground state of psi. So if something has ground energy uh, zero, um, excuse me, if anything has energy zero, then it must equal psi. Right, so then I get psi equals psi prime, which is a contradiction. Right, so if, I mean, yeah, if I started off with two states that were the same, they are always locally indistinguishable, but, you know, morally, you want two very different states. Um, okay, so local indistinguishability is a really nice property. It sort of is a, a signature of quantumness in this sense, right? It gives us a very easy way of proving circuit depth lower bounds. But let's notice a problem with this argument which is this argument isn't really robust. Ideally, what I would like to say is that if psi was complex, if I could prove that psi was, you know, required uh, at least log d circuit depth, that a state nearby psi would also require log depth, right? I, I sort of hope that this, is, this notion of complexity is robust to perturbations. And the reason why I need this robustness is because in the end, I want to make my NLTS argument about all low energy states. So making a statement about all low energy states is necessarily some sort of robust statement, right? Because small perturbations of the state don't change the energy too much. So at some point or the other, I'm, I'm going to need to make my argument robust. And what I can say is that this argument was actually slightly robust, um, but it, it was only robust to a very small perturbations, perturbations on the order of 1 over n. And the reason that was is that the spectral gap of this Hamiltonian HU was 1 compared to a total energy of n. So as long as I could even find that some psi prime was, you know, below energy 1 half, that would be enough of a contradiction. But 1 half compared to the total energy n gives you this order 1 over n perturbation issue. So we're going to have to do something to make it more robust. And uh, what we'll do is we'll use some mathematics from Chebyshev polynomials in order to make this lower bound robust. And so I think if you watch the version of this talk I gave at the Simons, I, did, I sort of skipped this part. So today I thought it would be nice to talk about this part and skip a part about expansion later. So over two talks, you can see more of the argument. So let's try to make this local indistinguishability argument robust. OK, so morally, what was going on? Well, when we were looking at this Hamiltonian HU, there was always this projector in the back of our mind, pi, which was 1 minus HU over n. And this projector. Uh, the, sorry, excuse me, this operator pi, it's almost a projector in the sense that it takes the, uh, the state psi, it preserves the state psi, but any other state, it doesn't collapse it too much. It only uh, pushes it down by 1 minus 1 over n. So it's a very weak notion of an approximate projector, but it's an approximate projector nonetheless. So what we'll see is that if you can construct a better approximate projector, you can actually make these lower bounds robust. So this is a, a fun fact uh, in mathematics that you know, my collaborator Anurag Anshu uses in basically every one of his results, um, which is that you know, there, there exists this polynomial p of degree roughly root n, so that if you apply p to the Hamiltonian hu, it ends up becoming a really good approximator to the exact projector. In fact, it's only mu off. Uh, and so for any constant mu, you can just pick this to be degree root n. Okay, and this polynomial, the way you build it is, it's actually a Chebyshev polynomial that approximates the OR function. Because roughly, what do you want it to do? You want it to, at zero, it should look kind of like one. And for all the um, incremental values, one over m, two, two over m, all the way to one, this polynomial should sit really close to zero. Right, it should sit up a plus or minus mu. And you can uh, show that this polynomial exists of only degree root n using some Chebyshev techniques. OK, this, if I apply this polynomial to this Hamiltonian h, u, I get another local Hamiltonian, but the locality has increased quite drastically. In fact, you know, maybe it's not even safe to call it a local Hamiltonian. Let's just call it a Hamiltonian. And the locality is 2 to the t times square root n, 2 to the t coming just from the fact that that was 
the locality of HU to begin with, and then the root n is coming from this application of the polynomial, right? You're combining root n terms together. Worst case, you get this sort of amplification. So you have a very uh, a larger locality Hamiltonian, but you have a much better projector now. Okay. So let me just box that up and put it in, over the side, and let's call L what this locality was. So uh, it's just going to be some function order, 2 to the t times root n. Okay, and let's, let's try to do something fun. Let's say that I take the state psi, which is the, the ground state of HU, and I measure it, and I get a distribution D. And let's chart the distribution D by saying that there are sort of these two areas on the Boolean hypercube, S1 and S2, that are of interest. And let's assume that these, they're interesting because uh, if you were to measure, you would see a term from S1 with probability mu, and likewise, you'd also see a term from S2 with probability mu. So we're getting that this uh, distribution sort of, you know, it's got some constant weight on two regions, S1 and S2. Okay, let's call pi S1 the projector onto this set of strings in S1, and pi S2 the projector onto the strings of S2. So the first thing I get is I get that if psi is inducing this distribution D, which has good mass on both S1 and S2, then I have this equation that if I was to sandwich psi between the projector onto S1 and the projector onto S2, I could argue up to infinity norm that this is a big number. It has to be at least mu. And that just comes directly from the fact that that's the induced distribution. Okay, now let's make an assumption. Let's say that the minimum Hamming distance between S1 and S2 was bigger than L. L, uh, crucially, is the locality of P of HU in the top right in the box thing. Let's assume that it was larger. And what do I mean by the Hamming distance between two sets? I mean that that's sort of the number of bit flips you'd have to make in order to take any string from S1 to a string in S2. So it's the minimum over all these. So let's assume that there's a, you know, a nice wide berth between the two of them. Then I'm going to get the following consequence. I'm going to get that uh, if I was to instead look at uh, P of HU sandwiched between these two projectors, I would get that this is zero. And why I get that is because the locality of P HU is small compared to the distance between S1 and S2. So no, none of the terms of this Hamiltonian could compare some of the mass in S1 and some of the mass in S2 simultaneously because the S1 and S2 are far apart. So what I'm going to get is that this uh, operator is zero. But now let's look at the three equations on this slide that involve an infinity norm, right? One uh, equation is one, two, and the box equation. And let's recognize that they cannot be consistent, right? And that's, uh, so somewhere we have in introduced a contradiction. So the only possible contradiction, we could rewrite it as saying that the locality L, the 2 to the t times squared n, must be too, uh, has to be bigger than the distance, right? It has to surmount the distance. Or another way of saying this is that whenever you have a distribution D so that it uh, induces masses uh, of mu on two regions, S1 and S2, with the distance of L in between them, the, there is a, a minimum circuit depth required to generate that distribution D. So it's actually proving a lower bound of any quantum state, which if you measured would induce this distribution, and that lower bound scales like L squared mu over N. Right? So a priori, let's notice that this argument requires that uh, L needs to be at least square root N, right, in order for this lower bound to be non-trivial. Um, and so let's say that L is bigger than square root N and mu is some constant, then let's call this distribution, uh, let's call it well-spread. Uh, and what we have is that well-spread distributions are a signature of quantum depth. So whenever you have a quantum state and you can prove that measuring it induces a well-spread distribution, you have certainly proved that that state uh, has high circuit complexity. And let's just pause and notice that uh, this is a robust argument, right? If I had, was to take any distribution D and I perturbed it just a little, let's say I perturbed the distribution D by uh, mu over two, right? Then what I would get is another distribution which would certainly have mass at least mu over two on both S1 and S2, so I could still make the same lower bound 
up to constant factors. So I have the, this, uh, this lower bound here is the robust version, and it, it turns out to suffice. Um, let me say that a version of this lower bound and this argument appeared first, not by uh, the works of uh, myself, uh, Anurag, and Nico, but actually it's, um, it appears in Eldar and Harrow in a slightly different argument but morally uh, up to some of the constants and stuff, that argument has been known for a while on how to make this robust. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about error correction because we need to now find uh, well-spread distributions, right? We have that well-spread distributions are uh, sort of the signature of quantumness, so let's, let's try to find some examples that include well-spread distributions. So if you take just a classical error correcting code, n nothing quantum right now, uh, and, you know, such a code can then be expressed as a kernel of some uh, matrix H. And here I'm going to use H uh, in light font versus dark font to distinguish it from Hamiltonians. Um, so it's just the solutions to HX equals zero. It sort of looks like this. This is the picture you should have. It's just a bunch of dots within the Boolean hypercube. And the nice thing is that the distance between them is going to be large. And this is certainly true for, let's say, a random uh, matrix H that you thought about. Now, what happens when I start to try to plot out the states that violate only a small fraction of the uh, terms? So the first thing I should notice is that starting from any of the code words, I should be able to bubble out a little bit, right? If I was to take local uh, changes, just, make a f just adjust a few of the bits on any of the code words, I wouldn't violate too many checks now. Uh, let's assume this... This uh, code is LDPC, so you know violating a, f a few more bits doesn't change uh, drastically into how many checks you violate. So you should certainly expect some sort of bubbling out around the code words. What is sort of surprising is that you'll also see these sort of phantom clusters appear, um, where there's sort of no bubbling out at all. And maybe I should say a little bit about where this phantom cluster comes from. So let's say you took the matrix H and you deleted a row. If H was a good code, deleting a row shouldn't change the distance too much. But what it will do is if you delete a row from H, it will uh, double the number of solutions, right? So suddenly if I take H and I delete a row, I'm going to get a bunch of new solutions. But they're going to be solutions to a new code. So they, those sort of are the centers of these phantom bubble clusters that appear. And what I'm getting is that now you, if I continue this and I delete you know, some epsilon fraction, I will still get this uh, clustering to occur. And you can make all this rigorous by just sort of looking at small set expansion slightly. But let's just pause and realize that, hey, these clusters sort of look like well-spread distributions. Yeah, in the well-spread distribution picture I drew last time, there were only two regions, S1 and S2. But if you were to take a union of these clusters and call some of that union S1 and take the other ones and call that S2, you seem to have a well-spread distribution because I have this distance bound that scales like N in between any two of these clusters. So what I actually have is that the low energy space of a code, it's a great support for a distribution that we hope to prove is well-spread. So if I could prove that my distribution is supported on a, on a code space, or excuse me, if I could prove that my distribution is supported on the low energy solutions of a code, then I'll be, you know, I'm, I'm starting to make good progress towards NLTS. Okay. Now, you might say, hey, Chinmay, why aren't you just considering a classical code? I mean, that's a great idea. If you consider a classical code and you consider the Hamiltonian that um, corresponds to it, you will get that uh, it will be supported on one of these kind of distributions, but you won't get the key property you need in well-spreadness that you have constant mass on both halves. If you consider a classical Hamiltonian, there will be classical solutions, which are distributions supported on just singletons. Okay, so the real question that's left is how do we construct a Hamiltonian with such a property? And for that, we're going to go to our third idea of erasure errors. Okay, so let's now put a little quantum back in this picture and say, hey, if you have uh, a quantum uh, 
error correcting code and you have an erasure, let's just notice that this naturally induces local indistinguishability. So another reason why we should think of error correcting codes when we think of NLTS. So this thought argument is actually really simple. So imagine that you know, you're walking down the street with your favorite error correcting code and some of the qubits fall out. You know? um, okay, you say, oh, that sucks, and you, know, you apply your recovery map and you construct it again. But then say someone was to come around and pick up those uh, missing qubits, now you'd seemingly have a problem, right? Because what you have is you've just perf performed cloning on that blue region. So either uh, something really messed up has happened or there's some simple resolution. The simple resolution is that whatever was encoded in that blue region was an invariant of the code. It contained no information. So cloning it was not a problem because you actually knew exactly what that state was all along. And, that's, and that exactly is what happens. And this, another way of saying this is saying that uh, no matter what code word you started off with, the reduced density matrix on that blue region, on that correctable region, was an invariant. Or in other words, that error correcting codes imply local indistinguishability. And that's why originally in the, I called local indistinguishability D, because D is the distance we uh, parameter in error correction. Okay, so we have error correction implies local indistinguishability. Um, and this immediately implies that exact code words of distance D require circuits of log D depth to generate. So we also, you know, immediately have that the exact code words have some log N circuit lower bounds because we know of codes of polynomial distance. Um, furthermore, these error correcting codes that we have with these polynomial distance bounds, they're LDPC. So they naturally also induce a local Hamiltonian, the one that just... Uh, has a Hamiltonian term corresponding to every check. So the real question is now, how do we prove circuit depth lower bounds for the low energy subspace of these Hamiltonians? And to do that, we're going to have to start thinking about something a little bit more specific. Let's talk just about CSS codes. Um, so, you know, CSS codes are constructed from two codes, CX and CZ, but what really matters to me is that C CSS codes have a picture that looks very similar to how classical codes look. So CSS codes have the property that, unlike code words being single points, we should think of the uh, code words as bubbles themselves. And those are, uh, these clusters are related by adding CX perp. So I have a bunch of clusters, and what I have is that the distance between the clusters uh, corresponds to this. And the second thing you should know is that there's actually two pictures always. There's an X picture and a Z picture. I'm only going to draw one at a time, but should always remember that there's actually two pictures going on whenever I draw this. OK, so let's do the same thing. Let's talk about expanding CSS codes. And the picture should look kind of the same. I start off with the original bubbles, and I expand a little, so I bubble out a bit. That bubbling scales like epsilon, right, as drawn on the bottom but I will also have these phantom bubbles, these phantom clusters that appear. So I get that you know, if I have an expanding CSS code, if I was to take a low energy state and measure, I'm going to get that in the X picture, I will be well supported on, these, on, the, on the bubbles in the X picture. And when I measure in the Z picture, I'll be well supported on the bubbles in the Z picture. And that's just from the fact that roughly these CSS codes have 50% X checks, 50% Z checks. OK. Um, yeah, so if I consider you know, epsilon over 200 low energy state, I get like some 99.5% uh, support. OK. Now, what, all that's left, right, is to prove that the distribution, when I measure, has mass on two support, separate regions. Or in some sense, that there's some way of partitioning the X picture or the Z picture so that I have at least some constant mass on both sides. And really, all I want to argue is that the distribution doesn't put too much mass on any one cluster. That any one cluster could not have 99% of the distribution. Uh, and this would induce a well-spreadness. And the 99 and the 99.5 together give you this mu equals 1 over 400, but let's not worry about that. OK. So what's our saving grace? You know, what's helping us over the classical picture? Well, it's the fact that there's two pictures always, right? There's an X picture and a Z picture. 
So what we're going to be able to show is not necessarily that the picture isn't clustered in both the X picture and the Z picture, but all we're going to show is that it can't be simultaneously clustered in both the X picture and the Z picture. That you can't have the, the distribution can't look like just one of these clusters in both cases. And if you have that, then you're going to have the lower bound because you have the lower bound from either the X argument or the Z argument, so you're done. In order to do that, we should use uh, something very simple. We'll just use an uncertainty principle. You know, uncertainty principle says that if you're certain of the measurement in the X basis, you're uncertain completely in the Z basis. But you can also provide a version of uncertainty that's sort of a more gradual toggle, and that's what's stated here. It says if you say there's two sets S and T, and the distributions are DX and DZ, then if you're very certain in, uh, on the Z picture, you're pretty uncertain on the X picture. And this, there's a fall off of this uh, square root term of uh, S times T. Okay, so let's just do this. If we're 99% concentrated on some Z cluster, let's assume for the purpose of contradiction, let's prove that we're not concentrated in the X picture. Um, and all we need to show is that for some cluster X, DXT is less than 0.99. Okay, so the way we do this is uh, we just need to first compute the sizes of these clusters. So remember, these clusters are formed by starting with a code word and then bubbling out by a radius of epsilon. So that's exactly what we're going to get, that the size is bounded by this combinatorial term that scales on epsilon and the size of the initial uh, CX per bubble. And you can show that this uh, scales like Rx plus order square root of epsilon times n. And similarly, you're going to get a bound on the size of t, so if we were to put this together in the uncertainty principle, we're going to get that dxt is you know, bounded by some term one-fifth plus, now here's the fun part, is you're going to get two to the negative k plus order square root epsilon n. That the rate of the code actually appears. And this might seem like a sort of strange idea that the rate sort of appears in this situation. And I'll argue that it's actually coming from the fact that when the code is very degenerate, there's also many different local indistinguishable arguments you're sort of applying in tandem. And that's what's happening in reality and why the rate of the code is appearing here. So you're going to get that as long as epsilon is less than k squared over n squared roughly, that uh, you're not uh, too supported in any x cluster. So we see that immediately we see that whenever you have high rate and high distance plus expansion, you have this NLTS property. So that's sort of the conclusion of what I'll say today, which is that, you know, linear rate plus linear distance plus expansion is sufficient. And then what we showed in our paper explicitly was that the laverrier zemore construction, uh, you can modify the distance argument a little to argue this expansion property. But uh, let me say that in progress right now is we're actually showing that this expansion is inherent in all linear rate and distance codes. So it's not something you have to assume, it's actually just implied by being rate and distance. Uh, and that's sort of a fascinating goal. So hopefully we'll be able to say that NLTS is more a general property than something about a specific construction. <laughs> okay, so last seconds. What should we think about next? Well, while NLTS is a necessary uh, consequence of quantum PCB, we did isolate this idea of computation from robust entanglement and only focused on the entanglement part. So a great first step is to sort of construct NLTS Hamiltonians that via reductions capture the complexity of NP or MA. Our constructions are just error correcting codes, right? So they don't capture co computation. But is there a way to introduce computation to make this hard? Okay. Um, and secondly, we should be honest that constant depth quantum circuits were one of the types of ansatzes that we, should, we could have assumed for classical descriptions of quantum states. Um, really, quantum PCP implies that all such descriptions uh, are insufficient. So there's all sorts of other examples of classical descriptions of quantum states, such as stabilizers. Um, and we should be able to prove lower bounds against all of these descriptions if we believe quantum PCP is true. I think I'll leave you with my favorite one, which is you apply a Clifford circuit and then you apply a constant up circuit on top of it. That's an NP witness as well. And I've been trying to prove lower bounds for this object for a bit. 
uh, very unsuccessfully. So I would, I would love to see this occur. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the great talk. Questions? Yes. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the great talk and congratulations on the result. Um, I wanted to ask you about the expanding Tanner codes uh, thing that you had, mm -hmm. uh, where you had this ball where there were certain green bubbles without a code word inside it. So I have like a two part question about that. I guess my first question is, um, does, yeah, so first question is, can you give me some intuition for what are the type of states that violate uh, the Hamiltonian by that much, like within that green bubble, but don't really, but aren't really close to a code word? And secondly, um, I guess if there was a code word in there, the state, the Hamiltonian would have been more degenerate. So is there, is that also like a statement on the degeneracy of that code and whether if it was more degenerate, such a code construction might not be the best candidate? Um, okay, l let's start with the first part. Okay. Um, so let's just think about the classical example, right? So classically there was, we bubbled out from code words and we formed these phantom clusters. The intuition as to why the phantom cluster appears is sort of, it's a consequence of first jumping a big distance and then bubbling. So the bubbling itself comes from just taking a code word and flipping a few of the bits. That only violates a few of the errors. So that's why both the original cluster and the phantom cluster bubble. Now the reason why you suddenly jump is that comes from completely violating one of the checks. It's sort of like just saying, I'm just gonna ignore one of the checks and be happy with it. That's gonna form this big jump. And that's, that sort of is what small set expansion says. Small set expansion roughly says that either I sort of stay close to a solution or suddenly I make big jumps. And then the, the picture in the quantum setting, it does the same thing, but it just starts from bubbling out from this um, uh, co-class, right? This co-CX per class. Um, so what would be different if you had a code that had code words in those phantom In bubbles? everyone. So that would be local testability. So oh, local okay. testability implies that you always sit near a code word. So that sort of implies that the bubbles, every bubble has a code word in the center of it. What we're sort of arguing here is that local testability is not necessary. Uh, what you needed was sort of the weaker sub-notion of expansion. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question? Hi. Um, I kind of think of the property you need of the code uh, to be kind of similar to the properties you need for like local decoding. Uh, do you think if you can prove that all good QLDPCs uh, give sort of like an LTS, do you think that's also going to give you like a local decoder, kind of like a flip style sort of thing? Um, that's a great question. So it would be fundamentally interesting if you could argue from just decodability some NLTS property and not require rate or distance. I would, I, I would think that's very interesting. I don't see any reason why not. I don't think that having linear rate and linear distance is necessary. Um, I think there are probably codes with sublinear uh, distance and sublinear rate that are NLTS. It's just harder to prove. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for great talk. Uh, uh, is there some linear depth quantum circuits that actually creates the ground state over NLTS Hamiltonian? Sorry, if you, linear depth quantum circuits? Linear depth quantum, did you also construct linear depth quantum circuits to generate ground state of NLTS Hamiltonian? Um, so these Hamiltonians are stabilizer, right? Which means that actually I think there's a log squared n depth circuit to always generate uh, the solution. And okay. that circuit is Clifford. And also, if you, if you perform measurement, is it constant generatable no. by constant depth? No. No, so measurements and, uh, are also included in this picture. So even if you have measurements in the circuit, the circuit lower bounds still hold. Because all the weights of the LDPC codes or constant depth, it can be measured in within constant depth, no? Ah, right. But then you have classical computation, right? 
after ah, c- c- classical decoding may require logarithmic runtime. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank yeah, you for So the classical part will take time. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe one final short question. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering, you were only talking about the low energy states effectively being hard to prepare. Do you think it is possible to generalize uh, these results to show like the enti- that the entire kind of eigenbasis is uh, hard to prepare on those circuits? Um, so every exact eigenvector of a code is takes log n depth to prepare because um, you can just argue that in some way or another it looks like some error correction. But mixtures or superpositions of them will be easy. I mean, because at some point you're going to include the zero state, right, at some energy. So there's some constant at which the zero state sits, right? The zero state actually sits at n over two energy. So epsilon is at most n over two. So, sorry, epsilon is at most half. Okay, now my question was more about like how close you can actually get to those states effectively, right? We can create mixtures, but whether all those states can be really protected from the gates. Oh, I think, I think you should be able to argue for any state that is some nearby any code word also, okay. up to constant bubbles, because sort of you just sort of change your perspective a little and argue that that state is the ground state of, the Hamil- of some other code. Right. Thanks. Okay. So thank you again, Jinmai. <laughs>